see how many people pop okay. in. Yep, it says webinar is now live. The webinar is now broadcasting to all attendees, so. Daniel. No, that's me. Oh. Okay, people are starting to pop in now. Sweet. I can't believe if you have 11 of them, they even want me to do this. They get tired of me. <laughs> We're just going to book you every month. <laughs> they get tired of me. They hear me all the time. For those of you that have joined the webinar, we'll begin shortly. Thank you for attending. Okay, seven people and I can't see any of that. You know what I need? Need some mood music. I'm a little scared now. Shouldn't be. Oh, one of my customers just texted me. I have, I have two minutes till we'll go ahead and start the webinar shortly. Thank you for attending. You don't want to stop your music, do you? <laughs> you can let it play the whole time. It's cool. Ah. 
I wouldn't want to interrupt perfection. <laughs> Is somebody else here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's four o'clock. Well, it's four o'clock Eastern time. For some of you, it's not four o'clock. I see some of my friends in other time zones here. So uh, my name is Thad Goodman. I'm the immediate past president of the CSI Next Chapter. Uh, welcome to our August 20th bonus session. We felt like this one was very timely and important for us to be able to discuss in today's environment. Uh, the topic is airborne concerns for construction. Our presenter today is Heath Warner. He's a climate control specialist from the Chase E. Phillips Company. And uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. You have been brought in on mute. Uh, feel free to put anything that you want in the chat. When this presentation is over, uh, you will receive a link to a survey. Please fill that out. That's the way we know that you were here and we get you your certificates and your, we can record your AIA credits as well. Uh, which you should have put in upon registration. If for some reason you do not get it, uh, I will be reaching out to you in the next couple of days to make sure that we've got you recorded correctly because I can see that you are here. Um, and with that, Heath, I'll let you take it away. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Thad. Thanks for CSI Next for sponsoring this and thank you to all the attenders. Um, probably the, the easiest way to start this off is um, this is going to sound like a lawn, an old man yelling on his lawn to get off of it, but uh, my, my background, the first 20 years uh, I spent in construction on the supply end of the, the business, specialty grouts, specialty caulking, specialty materials, repair products. One of the, the cool things about that end of the, the industry, for me anyway, was being a distributor we didn't really work directly for any manufacturer. So I was able to provide the best product for the best solution for the customer. I mean, especially patching materials alone, just for horizontal patching, there might be 30 different products that you could use and not being beholden to a manufacturer meant we could match up what, what the best was. The second part about that I liked the most was, and I know there's a couple of my customers and can I consider friends on here today is, I got to get involved in a lot of situations, problem solving that you normally wouldn't. And working for a distributor, I could work at the owner level, at the construction manager level, the general contractor level, clear down all the way into the subs, flooring contractors, drywall contractors, painting contractors. And I almost got to be a fly on the wall because I wasn't directly involved in the process. I was just there to try to help provide solutions. And a lot of what we're gonna go in here today, a lot of this kind of grew out of that. Back when the EPA changed some regulations, we'll touch on it again in Ohio anyway, back in 2009, a lot of construction changed. And by 2011, those regulations changed our industry so much that I was getting involved in a lot of problems and or delays to projects that were costing a lot of money. We kept running into the same problems over and over and over until one day a really good customer looked at me and said, there has to be a better way. We can't keep doing this. And at the time we had just started looking into climate control as far as avenues and methods for actually eliminating problems before they even started. And that's where it grew. As far as uh, airborne concerns, I think a lot of this is just, as Dad mentioned, really timely because of the, the viruses. But a lot of the information really goes the same. But for me, it kind of started as a personal journey. So maybe this is a little bit of revisionist history. I'll ask all of you, how's your 2020? Because uh, the way I look at it, my recollection might be foggy, but it seems to me 2019 was a very good year. 2020, on the other hand, maybe it's just me. I kind of feel like this. Yeah. So CDC guidelines. Back in March, when all of the COVID stuff really started hitting, um, 
I did what probably a lot of people were doing is we were shutting down businesses and industries. I started going searching for answers. I I started reading absolutely everything I could, every news article, just looking for scientific studies, for some kind of numerical data, something that was more than just a computer model. And it didn't seem to me like there was a whole lot of truth out there. There were basically two sides of the argument. This is the end of the world. It's the next plague. The other side was, that's eh, just the flu. I kind of felt like I was typing my symptoms into WebMD and uh, I either had a common headache or it was stage four brain cancer and I was gonna die of a tumor. What really kicked it off for me was not, not only being able to, to determine what was gonna happen long-term personally, I started noticing things. As far as construction and our jobs go, you know, there was a very short period of time where a lot of projects were shut down maybe a couple of weeks it varied across the nation but the day that i got the the actual verbiage that you see on the left of the screen this was actually sent to me as an email and as i started reading this email i said oh my gosh if the industry is going to go this way long term i mean assigning distance monitors all of this to get into the site minimum PPE, whole entire different and separate training program, that's gonna change everything. And we're already involved in an in industry that thinks the average project needs to be completed in nine to 10 months. Everything's fast track. There's no time for delays. The jobs that are out there now, they don't have this extra time built into them. And going forward, we're not going to either. Furthermore, the real reality is, at a, oops, sorry, at a certain point, every project ends up having everybody on top of each other drywall contractors painters flooring contractors hvac contractors all crammed into the same room like sardines social distancing isn't necessarily going to be an option we, we at the time um, i mentioned doing climate control we actually had adapted some some equipment to be used specifically for virons. And I was talking to the contractor about using them. And the comment actually kind of surprised me. The, the, the comment was, well, number one, we're just gonna do what the CDC tells us right now. The, what you see on the left is what the CDC is telling us that we have to do. And number two, going forward, the plan for our company, we're gonna start the HVAC system, the permanent HVAC system as early as possible in an attempt to try to care, take care of this. I've already done quite a bit of research on permanent HVAC systems, and I know that that wasn't the best course, but I didn't have all the answers. So I went ahead and did some more research. Doing that research um, kind of led to what we're gonna talk about today, but overall, since I had already done that for several other things, it just adapted. Airborne concerns, whether they're virons, or whether it's dust particulates or VOC compounds, they're all really similar. And when I say really similar, they're really similar. So probably the easiest example to give everybody that you're used to is temporary heating. In a historical context, our projects used to shut down in the winter and I'll date myself. Um, I've been doing this almost 25 years now. When I started, we shut down projects in winter. It wasn't until about the second or third year that the heaters, open flame heaters, were really used on a widespread basis. It was great. Initially, people could keep going during the winter. They didn't have to worry about shutting down. They could get the heat that they needed to keep going. Problem was, as most things go, issues pop up. OSHA steps in and they say, um, yeah, that's great that you have combustion inside the work area, but you're not allowed to have more than 50 parts per million of carbon monoxide inside that work area within an eight hour period, exposure for your workers. Trouble with that is, and if you've ever done volume calculations on most construction sites, you cannot produce enough heat to maintain a building at between 50 and 60 degrees for finishes that are gonna be safe without 
introducing ventilation from the outside. Not to mention moisture levels inside from that combustion process create a whole other host of issues. But that ventilation from the outside that you need means you're gonna pump in cold air just to bring down, oops, sorry. Just to bring down the, uh, the CO2 level within the building, which means you need more fuel to overcome that. So overcoming that led to indirect fired units. So you basically set the unit outside. That way you don't have to worry about the combustion inside of the work area. And everybody's happier because you don't have the CO2 level, except for that heating unit that sits outside. 30% of every BTU that you create outside of the work area just overcomes ambient. So fuel costs have increased in the last few years by at least 30% per month, just overcoming the issues that you have with combustion. Secondary issue I kind of talked about a little bit ago. In 2009, when uh, the EPA stepped in, Ohio threw in with a lot of other states, that 350 grams per liter totally changed the industry. Instead of having solvent-based sealers and floor adhesives, in order to comply, manufacturers came up with water-based sealers. What that ended up doing was uh, no longer, since all construction projects are fast track and if a floor isn't brown or black when it's done, it's not finished, everything is so tightly troweled, we don't have the hydration rates that we used to have. General rule of thumb used to be you needed 30 days for every inch of concrete to get the RH out to levels for the flooring. It's not there anymore because we're putting polyolefin underneath too. So what's the answer? Either mis mitigation systems that three to five dollars a square foot, barrier chemicals put into the concrete at seventy dollars per yard, marginally effective either way, but no matter how you slice it, you're greatly adding to the cost of doing the job. Solution for a lot of contractors, we're going to turn on the permanent HVAC system and we're going to just bake that moisture out of that floor. Also marginally effective, but another reason you bring it online as early as possible. Last example, dust and silica. Just in 2018, again, industry totally changes. Old days, we'd open up windows, use fans to blow dust around, throw down some sweeping compound, maybe give the laborer a dust mask to push stuff around. Not anymore. Under table one, if the equipment is available, then you have to use it. So now it's all kinds of specialties, shop vacs, HEPA vacs, all kinds of um, drill attachments, grinder attachments, everything has to have some kind of a dust containment apparatus. Again, you talk to enough people, well, this is how we're gonna get around a lot of that. They'll bring the permanent HVAC system online, expecting to get the filtration from the, from the permanent system. Sounds well and good. When you were talking about the removal of those airborne contaminants, there are basically two sides to the coin. There's dilution and filtration. Dilution's pretty self-explanatory, and I'm sure most of here know the golden rule for HVAC design for most safe buildings, a lot of people that I don't know, is four air changes per hour, somewhere between four and five. And the real reason behind that, the magic starts happening, is that in order to clean out 99% of the particulates that are in there takes about 69, 70 minutes at four air changes an hour. That's why if you can push it to five, continually cycling that air will keep the air much cleaner and then effectively move the air out every hour. The other side of the coin is, mer is filtration. So when you talk about filtration, it surprises me the number of people that don't actually realize there are varying levels of filters available everywhere from MERV one, which is the red zone, clear all the way down to MERV 16. They actually go all the way up to 20. And then there's one above that. But for construction, filtration is gonna be kind of an issue. So most of the time, until you can get a permanent system up and running, in construction anyway, we are stuck using dilution. Pros and cons to it. The one pro is for most construction, um, General traffic in and out is built in dilution. The other pro to construction is, especially if you've got windows, you can see 
you just open up a window. You add, add some windows, you add some fans, and you have built-in ventilation, which actually can work. What you have to look out for though, and this, for this situation is really interesting, um, you'll notice that on, this is actually um, a senior living center. You'll notice that there are no windows on floor one and no windows on floor two that are open, only windows on floor three. The problem with dilution for construction is you're tied 100% to the ambient environment, meaning your temperature, your humidity, it's whatever it is outside. I use the uh, Drywall Finishing Council graphic because I think most people recognize it at this point, but it's probably the best representation of what is actually going on when you're tied to ambient conditions. When you look at a data sheet, every material in the world, whether it's drywall compound or an epoxy coating or a wall paint, it's tested at 74 degrees at 50% hum relative humidity in a laboratory. Not exactly real world conditions. So if you get out on a job site and your humidity goes even at, let's say 70 degrees, if your humidity goes from a relatively controlled 40 or 50% up to 90 or 100%, which in a wet climate like Ohio and down south, and most of the Midwest, honestly, in the summer, you just went from having something that would cure out in one day to something that'll take three to five days to cure. It just compounds and just stacks. The other issues that you're gonna run into because it's slowing down your schedule, warranty issues. Every manufacturer publishes on their data sheets for flooring coatings, wood case work. There are temperature and humidity um, restrictions that you are not allowed to, to exceed either way. And when you're tied to ambient, you lose all control of that. So wrapping up dilution, because we're probably not gonna have filtration, dilution actually is our only solution. And if you think about it, the way the way it's designed by even the CDC's recommendation. Normal, what is considered social um, norm distance is about three foot. When they tell you they want you to social distance is six foot, you're just de facto creating or doubling that amount of space. By increasing that amount of space, you're increasing your dilution. So for construction, there's no getting around it. Social distancing is probably your best bet at this point along with everything else. Now, what if you can get to the stage where you have an HVAC system available? Now we can start talking about filtration. Probably um, the most common for all of construction is gonna be a rooftop air handler. And you can see how easy it is to change the filter. All you gotta do is crawl up on the roof, drop this out and change your filter. So. Relatively simple process, right? What kind of performance can you expect out of it? Industry standard is ASHRAE 52.2. That particle size of one to, point, one to three micrometers, that's for a regular dust particulate. Real filtration, even though in the, the graphic that we showed earlier, you can get a MERV rating of one. Real filtration that you'll see here does not begin until MERV eight, nine, or 10. When you get up to MERV 8, 9, 10, you start talking about actually having dust filtration. In this case, MERV, MERV 10 is right about 50% of all dust. MERV 11 actually bumps that up to 65 and then so on and so forth. Clear up till where you can get almost 95% of particulates if you go clear up to MERV 16, which sounds really good. It's a good case for having filtration on your job site if you can get to it. Yes, they're effective, but here, here is, uh, here's what I found most surprising in this and why I believe, yeah, I won't go political with it, but why I believe this got so out of control and why we were shutting down commercial buildings all over the United States and the fear and the panic. If we take the same line and we draw MERV 8 as our starting level, in this case, dust arrest uh, effect, effect, efficacy, of about 30 to 35%. Look at where that's actually at. 30 to 35% MERV rate as a, as a entry level. That's where most commercial buildings are at. MERV level nine, that's set for hospital laboratories. You don't get 
clear up until MERV 11 for better commercial buildings, you don't have any real filtration of 60 to 65 percent. And it isn't clear until you get to a smoking lounge that you're going to get up to that 14 percent. My personal opinion, why it went so far as it did, we're kind of woefully prepared. Most of our permanent HVAC systems are under designed and underutilized to deal with dust particulates, let alone virus particulates. What are kind of all other alternatives are you seeing out there? Um, there is something better and actually easier to adapt than just trying to scale up a MERV filter. HEPA filters have been around for uh, about 30 years now. The nice thing about HEPA filtration is that uh, you can actually get 99.9% .9 of dust particulates out of the air just by using a HEPA filter. As far as businesses go though, you're seeing, you're seeing a push for schools to try to move that way. Um, the overall issue though is it, it isn't as easy as just modifying your HVAC system. You need a total redesign, uh, which I'll touch on again in a minute. But so what, what I've seen a lot is portable HEPA filter machines. And in, in fact, when all of this really hit in March and a lot of the temporary hospitals were starting up, um, there was a, a nationwide run on portable HEPA machines to the fact that almost every manufacturer in the United States was back ordered between two and three months because nobody was ready for it. And we've already proven in most hospital environments, HEPA filtration is used as a de facto um, under almost every job, just under ICRA requirements. That it actually is still a misconception though. Uh, and I don't know how this started, but I can't tell you how many times that I've been asked this and or is HEPA filtration actually any good for virin particles? Most people don't think it actually is. Quick side note though, if this is our one, and this, in this case, it's two and a half micrometer, but this is a normal dust particulate at two and a half mic, uh, micrometers. The coronavirus and most viruses, they live in this world of 0.1 micrometers. So to the people that actually thought the cloth masks were gonna do anything other than protect the people around you from what you're expelling, it isn't gonna happen. I, when we talk about the fact that most MERV filters only filter out 50% of a dust particle this large, they're not filtering out anything that's this small either. And that cloth mask sure isn't gonna do anything. But back to HEPA filtration. Uh, University of Minnesota and their study, what they ended up doing was they took silver particles between three and 20 nanometers. So five to 30 times smaller than a coronavirus particle. And they shot them through HEPA filtration. The result of the test, and this is, emphasis was mine, sorry. The result of the test, it, it's 99.9%, .9%, it's 100%. Effectively, when they call it a HEPA scrubber they're not getting, it cleans the floor the same way, or a HEPA filter is basically scrubbing the air the same way a floor scrubber scrubs the floor. If you can get HEPA filtration on your job, it is the most effective way of filtering out a virus particle. So. Back to uh, MER filtration and its use in construction. So if we know that even if we can get a permanent system running and a MER filter is even 50% effective, wouldn't it make sense then to go ahead and fire up that permanent system? Mm, maybe, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the next most common conception while we're there uh, most people think, well, hey, a uh, system's designed for a MERV-8, we'll just throw a MERV-12 in it and we'll capture everything. Uh, it's the same thing as trying to pound that square peg into that round hole. A system that's designed has to breathe at a certain level. And if that, if your permanent HVAC system is designed to breathe through a MERV-8 filter, if you try to choke it off and restrict it, like on a MERV-12, you've effectively cut off probably half to 65% of the air, depending on how um, how far you go with your filter. Ultimately, you're just gonna end up freezing up your coils and having problems. Some pictures here in a minute of that. So back to addressing the permanent system. Uh, 
when I started the presentation, I said one of the things that I enjoyed most about working for an independent distributor was it meant I could go through a whole bunch of different manufacturers and didn't have to worry about any personal bias. I think the same thing goes for any of the data that we talk about today. Do your own research, don't take my word for it. Every manufacturer is gonna tell you they don't want their system used during construction. So what I did was I went out and I tried to find an industry group that actually had some studies. And the reason that I picked this one was this is the most concise and complete open letter to business owners and their agents that I could find. I've got a link to it, hit me up afterwards, I can get it to you or research it on your own. But since I don't, well, I don't have to read it to you, but let me take a deep breath. Temporary uses, early startup of HVAC systems in building construction projects, the realities and the problems of using HVAC systems, which in my estimation is probably the longest title for an open letter that I've ever heard. And then there's also the unfortunate acronym that they go by, but it's from the Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning Contractors National Association, SMACNA. The information actually is a lot better than the title. Document opens with, and so I don't have to sit here and read all of it to you. I added some highlights, but the permanent HVAC system are specifically designed to provide comfortable and clean air conditioning for tightly enclosed, soundly constructed buildings and not buildings under construction. This again, opening, opening paragraph. With rare exception, it's not in the best interest of the building's owner to operate the permanent HVAC system for temporary heating and cooling for the purposes during a construction. Why might that be? Their point number one, even with special filters used for construction, extra pre-filters are incapable of protecting that system. Why would that be even if it's pre-filters? It's the excessive amount of dust. I think we all realize that. They go on to say in point two, attempts to dry out the surface, which was one of our other points. A lot of people are trying to dry their floors out. IA, IAQ problems associated with that. There are all kinds of studies if you start looking into it of systems that have been used to dry out floors so they can put gym floors down, VCT tile down, a myriad of studies out there that will show you that it exponentially increases the chances of mold growth within the ductwork. Early startup, permanent system, cooling dehumidification, it's gonna void your warranty. Most of the time an HVAC contractor is not gonna tell you that or they're just being told to go ahead and bring it online. Generally, the owner has not told that. Um, early startup result, reduced equipment life. Another one that most people don't want to talk about, but construction dust not only raises the operating temperature within that, that raised operating temperature significantly reduces that life depending on how much gets in there because every construction site is dirty, no matter how much filtration you have. The one I really didn't think about was the coils. I, all coil sets are actually manufactured in clean rooms. They're designed to be totally isolated and sealed away from all contaminants. Sheet rack, plaster, sorry Thad, drywall dust is a big huge problem for coil sets. They're actually doing a disservice by using the permanent system during the drywall phase altogether. Dust particulate in, uh, in the ductwork. This is another one you, you don't think about a whole lot. Um, if you get all of that particulate in there, the, the stage is set for that mold related concerns, but also just customer complaints. I have one of my customers that I've always joked around with that when, when they build a building, they build it for life. If a customer comes back and complains to them 20 years later, they go back and fix it. So imagine a system that isn't cleaned out correctly and you're continually going back or chasing your tail or replacing a whole HVAC system because it was used during construction. The last one, and this one really, it, this more than any of the other ones probably surprises most people. Total energy costs to use the permanent system during construction, you're actually spending more money. Most contractors think that they're, they're saving money by using the permanent system. And the reality is the way the construction industry is, they might be if the owner is paying for fuel, but generally 
because that HVAC system is designed to work under enclosed conditions and because construction is open by nature, that system has to run full tilt 24 seven just to try to maintain the conditions of a tightly sealed and controlled building, meaning your costs are gonna be through the roof. Ultimate conclusion, and I, yeah, it's so biased, I probably could have written it myself, so sorry, but like I said, look into it. If you request their field reports, they have a whole bunch of data and it's really some interesting stuff, but field reports, years of industry experience, detrimental effects to the use of the system. Here's the real kicker, should compel owners and their agents to make a more informed decision. A well-informed owner basically is not gonna allow his permanent system to be used under construction and I can't blame them. Link over here on the left, like I said, hit me up, I'll send it to you, more than happy. So I've tried to be a little bit lighthearted on a lot of this. At this point, you thought it was all gonna be fun and games, but I ask a serious question the amount of construction sites that we have going on that are operating on permanent systems. And if you're planning on using those specifically to filter out airborne contaminants, what are we doing? We already saw that the energy costs are higher and this varies by the portion of the nation, but I've been involved in projects where hospital jobs, it wouldn't be uncommon to have a laborer whose primary responsibility is to run around and change pre-filters. So let's just say that they spend about two and a half to three hours a day. We agree a laborer rates about 90 hours or $90 an hour. So at $30 an hour, just changing filters, you're spending $240 a day, $1,200 a week, or $4,800 a month just changing filters. And that's without the cost of the filter. So you're already spending a whole bunch more money up front then you get to the system clean out. Is it even in the contract? If it's in the contract, who's going to pay for it? The HVAC contractor, the GM, the GC, is the owner going to pay? Warranty issues. Did you just void your warranty? Are you still going to be able to get the full one? Decreased service life. How do you put a number on that? Potential mold growth, the higher energy costs. Ultimately, what it costs everybody. Increased costs, schedule delays, customer complaints. And this is the big one I kind of mentioned a minute ago. How do you put a dollar on not only customer complaints, lost faith, but the minute you have to go back to a job site, especially if it's a fairly major fix, it's going to cost you a whole bunch of money. So ultimately, it just costs you money to use the permanent system during construction. Ask me how I know. Um, so as to protect all innocent contractors, I have pictures of permanent systems, but it's a lot easier for me to show you what temporary equipment has problems with. Picture on the right, uh, dust particulates, every job site, especially when you get to drywall phase and dusting and grinding and everything else that goes along with it. The picture that you see on the left, this, is a 1.1 ton temporary air conditioner. That 1.1 ton temporary air conditioner should have a coil set that looks about like the radiator of your car, which we're all very familiar with. You don't see that, what you do see is a solid chunk of ice. Somebody decided that they should probably try to save $6 on a pre-filter and try to run a temporary air conditioner without any filter. Eventually, during the drywall phase, coils all clogged up, had a solid chunk of ice, it took about four hours to clean that unit out just to get the coil set back up and running. The picture on the right, obviously it's very similar, frozen coil, it's being thawed out, but this is actually damage that occurs and when I say damage, it's inefficiencies. When you're trying to overtax an air conditioner unit, this particular job um, really needed about 30 tons of air conditioning, the con which is really expensive. I'm not saying it's not, but just volume wise, it needed 30 tons of air conditioning. Contractor decided that they would try to roll the dice, go with a little bit lower output. They went with about 15 tons of output or half of what was actually needed. 
all of their H or all the temporary AC units were continuing to freeze up for the entire job. And the reason was they were operating 24 seven. The units were never cycling. So the coil sets not only couldn't breathe, they never could cool off to the point where they could actually be effective and clean themselves. That's very similar to what's going on with your permanent system if you're using it during construction phase. Temporary dehumidifiers, because all job sites are clean, I'm sure. No, again, no airflow, no function. Yes, that's my finger. And for people that think job sites aren't dirty, that's the filter. That unit couldn't breathe. Same thing ends up happening to these eventually. If your unit can't breathe, your coil set's gonna freeze, it's not gonna work. What is interesting to note, look at the position of all the filters on these. I'm gonna touch on that in a second. Even temporary heating. Um, most temporary fuel heat sources where we talk those direct flames or indirect flames, you can't run a filter on them. There is one heating source on the market that you can actually can run MERV filtration. But uh, just because it's winter doesn't mean job sites are gonna stop producing contaminants. This filter is so clogged up that it's literally crushed itself in. What was amazing was that this unit continued to function with not being able to breathe at all. Most of the time that'll burn out. But the same thing goes for if you're using your permanent system during the winter. If you're not keeping those uh, filters clean, you're not um, gonna have a functioning unit. Eventually you're gonna cause all kinds of damage. So, what I tell everybody, or when we start talking about using a permanent HVAC systems, remember the picture that we had a little while ago about all those rooftop units and how simple it was to just crawl up on the roof, take your little nut driver with you, zip, 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 and change your filter. If these filters are on temporary equipment at ground level, and literally all you have to do is slide them in and out, how often do you think permanent HVAC system filters are actually being changed on job sites? They probably are. Good general, general contractors, good construction managers, they'll stay on top of that. But it's gonna be a lot less likely to occur and you're gonna be much more likely to have issues. So going forward, if, if we kind of all agree at this point, it's probably not the best idea to be using the permanent HVAC system during the whole process. What could we do? You've already seen some of the pictures, but hydronic climate control or hydronic heating. Uh, there's probably a lot of people, depending on the part of the country you are, you probably aren't even familiar with this at all. Uh, technology itself has been around about 30 years, but really widespread um, only in about the last five years for the construction industry. The beauty of hydronic climate control is you take a heating unit, that sets outside of the work area, so there's absolutely no combustion inside the work area, and then that zooms in through the network of hoses and goes to the exchanger that sits inside the work area. That's what is actually fully filterable air. Sorry, there we go. The heating unit has glycol inside of it. What we're doing is we're essentially we have a boiler, it's a temporary boiler. We're flash heating food grade glycol up to about 180 degrees, pumping that glycol through 300 PSI hoses, but only 35 PSI. That heated glycol goes inside the work area, goes to those little boxes that you saw where it can be blown through filtered air and continuously recirculated. He, the glycol goes back to the heating unit to be re, um, recycled and reheated. So instead of having an open flame that has to operate 24 hours, seven days a week, or it doesn't create heat, hydronics actually have set points and supply and return temperatures. So if this temperature differential between supply and return isn't more than 30 degrees Fahrenheit, this entire unit shuts off. Furthermore, the exchanges that sit inside the work area, they have individual thermostats. Those individual thermostats can be set to any temperature that you want. Glycol can pass unused to the coil to be back here. Consequently, a hydronic system is probably gonna only operate about one sixth to one eighth of the time, depending on what the actual um, R value and how closed off your building is, which saves a tremendous amount of fuel. I always kind of struggle to put some kind of a scale to a unit like this. 
because you know you, people are used to permanent systems or torpedo heaters. This building um, on the right hand side is approximately 25,000 square feet. The center portion, um, two story portion is about 8,000 square foot here. This section is duplicated to the top of the page. So it's as long on this page, on that side as this side. This little box right here is heating 25,000 square foot on a 19.8 degree Fahrenheit day. So zero emissions inside the work area, dry and even heat because all the combustion is outside. It actually causes evaporation, fully MER filterable. And here's where the kicker is. You can actually adapt these to use HEPA filtration too. So now not only are you taking care of dust particulates on a job site, you can actually add a HEPA filter option and you can take care of all viral particles. Tremendous fuel savings. Instead of costing you more money to operate like a permanent HVAC system, this system will actually pay you to use itself. So as far as health and safety, top of the list. In fact, what you essentially have is you have a permanent HVAC system on a temporary basis that was designed specifically to use for construction, all saving the wear and tear on your permanent system. Same thing goes for temporary air conditioning. The, uh, the advancements that have come across in the last couple of years are amazing. There's one manufacturer already that has designed one for uh, hospital use. It runs entirely through a HEPA filtration. What is also interesting is they've decided to incorporate UV light, which is another one of the questions that I, I typically get a lot. UV light's a little bit different. Um, I'm interested to see how it shakes out. I think the technology is really cool for a permanent system. Uh, the questions that I have is when you start looking at the lifespan of the bulbs, um, the longest lifespan on the market right now is three years. Most of them are operating in the one to two year realm. So if you have a building owner that is good about filter changes, um, you'll probably be okay because they'll be good. They'll be all right with changing uh, the light bulb, the UV light. If not, you're kind of wasting your money because if you don't keep up with light bulb changes, it's designed on a special dwell time and airflow. For temporary construction use, I don't think it's probably going to become um, that valuable for our end of the industry. And it's specifically on that because it's designed for air volume and how long it has to hold that technology. And in all honesty, when you can get 99.999% filtration of all biologicals through a HEPA filter, there's really no reason to mess around with um, with a UV light because they're going to be temperamental and a lot less like or a lot more likely to be damaged under normal construction traffic. So stay tuned. We'll see where it develops, but it really is interesting to see people adapting all of their equipment to HEPA filtration this quickly. Finally, like I mentioned earlier, uh, just normal HEPA filter machines. There are so many different sizes available for all size jobs if you can find them and they don't sell out nationally. The other tip that I usually will throw in here, most people don't realize, almost all HEPA filters have the ability to not only run HEPA filtration, you can actually run a, a carbon pre-filter in them. Um, they're not cheap either, and neither are, are HEPA filters, but that carbon filter will take out 99.9% .9 of the VOCs that are cycling through, so there's no fumes going through. Really popular museums and hospital applications. Kind of wrapping it up here, temporary climate control equipment makes sense. And then for all the reasons that, that we mentioned, yes, 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 yes. Um, really though, to me, not only is it more portable, it's the wear and tear it's gonna save on your permanent system. It's less expensive to operate. And really for most of what we're doing, that's one of the keys. You can actually filter out more particulate through a temporary uh, temporary piece of equipment than you can on a permanent system. So as we talked about a lot of the the new equipment that's available out there, the the model the yellow liquid that you see 
in that pail and what the model is holding in your hand, that's the glycol that runs through the hydronic heating system. Most people, when you tell them glycol, they think antifreeze in your car. That's deadly if you let your dog lick it, don't do it, it's sweet. It's actually a, a propylene glycol. That propylene glycol is so safe, it's USDA approved for direct food contact. It's one of the main ingredients in shampoo, hand sanitizers, and women's cosmetics. In fact, the higher end women's cosmetics that they charge you a fortune for, they actually have a higher amount of glycol in them, even though it's relatively inexpensive. At that point, I was gonna kind of originally drop the mic and we could all do the Hollywood high five to a freeze frame and say, yes, this makes a whole lot of sense. But I thought there's probably a lot of you because the, the, in, the, the audience today is so widespread, you might not have a chance to, to work with me. So I thought the internet loves five keys. There's always the top five list for everything. So I would like to leave you with this, something to think about. If any of this interests you, really the keys to success, develop your plan up front. If you're proactive about having your plan, you'll save a fortune and you'll save the time. If you have that plan up front, you don't have to worry about the delays later. Establish your goals in that plan. Are, are your goals the temperature, the humidity, the dust? Are you worried about viruses? Are you worried about mold growth, mold spore development? That will determine the equipment that you use because it's very seldom that you're trying to control all of those at the exact same time which also goes to the beauty of um, temporary equipment that's portable. You can adapt as you need, which is point number four, monitor the progress, adjust as needed. Use the proper amount of equipment. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been called into somebody that's very frustrated because they can't control their humidity. And what they had done was somebody ran down to the Home Depot, bought two residential units, and somehow magically thought that that was going to control the humidity in a 25 or 30,000 square foot medical facility. There's a lot that goes into planning. So volume calculations, your R values, fuel sources available, the power sources that are available. Every project's different. Every project needs a custom job, custom plan, which that's the very last point. Partner with a company that understands construction. There are a ton of places out there, rental yards all over the place that can rent you equipment. But if they don't understand the different phases of the construction and what's needed for each phase, you're just gonna be throwing away time and money again and just end up just as frustrated. And with that, we're gonna conclude. I appreciate everybody coming here. What I will say is I tried to throw a little bit on the, the temporary uh, equipment, Thad, am I allowed to plug something else? If, you, if you're interested in more, uh, December 3rd, we're actually going to have a meeting specifically on the slide on the, the left where we delve into a lot more specific information on the advances in the climate control equipment and what it can actually do for you at every phase. So with that, thank you very much. Any questions? What can I do to help? There's a couple of things that you said. First of all, thank you very, very much. Very informative presentation. Very well done. It flowed extremely well. Thank you. Um, you said something earlier that a couple people have made comments in the chat and it kind of perked my ears up as well. Mm -hmm. Can you just spend a little time talking about the whole mask thing? Because you, some of your comments seemed a little interesting so can you just kind of and again we're past the aia portion uh we're a little bit more editorial comments if you'd be good enough to kind of walk us back through that and say okay is it for everybody else or for you that you're wearing this mask and, yeah, and what's the effectiveness there the effectiveness and you will see on that slide there's actually a particulate at the smallest level there we go this particulate is filtered by masks. And this is if you're gonna spend the money and get an N95 or an N100 mask, you can actually filter out all of these particulates. My comment was based on the back and forth discussion that was going on on cloth masks. Now, if I wasn't clear enough of that, I'm sorry. Cloth masks do not filter any one of these out. They might get the very large, the 10 micrometers, but they're not gonna filter out the one to three dust particulates 
in mass. Some might if you double them up. There are people that are putting regular register filters inside of them, but a regular single filter or single single um, layer cloth mask does not filter these out. What it really does is it protects everybody else from what you're expelling out. Does so, that does that answer it, Thad? Okay, so in other words, it would be a sign of respect to other people to wear it more than it would be assuming that if you went out on a heavy subway train in New York and you were wearing your mask, you'd be totally protected from other people. Yeah, you're, you're in fact, what you're actually seeing, uh, was it United? United no longer allows masks with the breather valves on their airplanes for that particular reason, because the breather valve actually expels the particulates out without filtering them back out. So as far as masks go, unless you're gonna go full N95 or go respirator cartridge, you're just protecting everybody else from, from what you're doing. So yeah, it's, it's the good human thing to do. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh, one other question was, and, and you've talked a lot about costs in a general sense. Mm -hmm. Do you have a case study that while we're on on this call that you could kind of go over, give us an example of a type of a building and kind of give us an example of, you know, the old kerosene based space heater or, yeah. or, you know, what we're, what we're doing and how it would work. I, I, so we can go through several of, uh, several different instances. I can tell you that there was 150,000 square foot, uh, building last year that the contractor was utterly amazed and even sent me, uh, sent me an email to say the same to heat that 150,000 square foot facility on hydronic heating they spent $1,547 in one month of December to heat the whole facility the other instance that I can point to for the extreme case and again all of these are custom and I can actually sit down if we want to go through a gym. in fact I'll tell you what we're past the AIA portion right yes sir okay. we're looking for the real facts all right, then let's do it. I'll go another step further for you. We can all still see my screen, all right? Not now. Uh-oh, screen sharing has stopped as the screen window is closed. Let me get that back. Do you have control there? I'm sorry. Uh, you're still the host. You I got have, it. Yep. You have total I'm control. Sorry. I went a little nuts with uh, screen sharing. So let's just take, this is generic. New medical office building. These are the actual numbers. Let me filter that. Oops. Dang on, I did it again. I'm, my apologies. Do this back up. Um, this one. Yeah, here we go. Can you see that? Uh, you're not sharing yet, young man. I'm sorry, it's not popping up on this. Let me close it and go back in, see if it'll show up then. And if we can't get it to, you know, we're about seven minutes to the hour. If we can't get it to show up, I may ask you to be willing to send yeah. something out to some of the more other than, folks. There. More than happy to. I don't understand why. I'll tell you what, let's go share this. There's that. There you go, there you're starting to share. Now let's see if, can you see that one now? Uh, I can see your email. Oh, why is it not new share? Here we go. There we go. My apologies. And share. Your email. Oh, yep, there you so go. See it okay. Now. okay, so here's a new medical office building. Um, fairly generic. It's a 30,000 square foot building, approximately 30 foot high. 60 degrees is the goal. It's on natural gas. Here's the actual equipment cost with the rental, but here's the information that you guys are specifically asking for. Your fuel predictions. Fuel predictions on natural gas, 
to heat that 30,000 square foot. And one thing I should mention in that, very specific to your all values, because like a permanent system, you're counting on recirculation, right? If our values are 23 in the wall, our value 38 in the ceiling. So fuel, fuel cost, I'm gonna shrink a little bit. I wanted to go in a little, but not that much. Fuel cost predictions are between $639 a month and $1,668 a month to operate a hydronic system. That's for temperatures between 37 degrees and zero degrees. When you start figuring out costs like that, law of averages take over because what winter in the world is it gonna be all 37 degrees and what winter is gonna be all zero degrees? So you take the average, you're looking at about $1,154 a month predictions to heat that 30,000 square foot building. On an open flame heater, based on calculations for the same conditions, you're looking at $14,597 a month at 37 degrees worth of fuel, or on the low end, zero degrees, $38,080 a month. Average between the two, $26,339. So if you saw the equipment cost earlier, it was $10,000 a month. So even if you add $10,000 a month to this, you're at 1154, your total cost per month, which is roughly half of what you were gonna spend to heat it on, on an open flame type system. Realistically, it pays you to use it. Where it goes wrong in construction, again, since the AIA is closed, usually but the way the contract's written, owner pays for fuel. So a good CM or a good GC will go back to the owner and they'll go in with a cost sharing plan. And we've done that plenty of different times where you'll go in and you'll actually show them the cost savings and they'll end up, even if you have winter conditions in your contract, you can usually negotiate back out because it just pays everybody. Not to mention all the other benefits that you get from accelerated schedules. Okay. Nothing still well, there. Go ahead. I, yeah, I said, is that enough detail or did you, you want some more? Given us all plenty to think about. Okay. <laughs> uh, Heath, do you have a slide that shows your contact information quickly? Sure. And if not, we'll, we'll get it out to everyone on the call afterwards. Uh, this particular presentation has been recorded. It'll be posted to our library eventually. Uh, if somebody wanted to have a PDF, would you be willing to send that out as well? Sure, that's no problem. All right. I'll just share this real fast. Oh, that didn't do it. New share. You see that? Oh, I can see your email. Yeah, that's got my contact info on it. It was the quickest thing I could think of. Okay. I didn't really put it on the slide because I hate to do that for AIA. Yeah, that's okay. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, we're at the end of our hour. We appreciate the presentation, some great information. Uh, thanks for being here. And for those of you who are on the call, look forward to our September meeting. We'll have it posted soon on the website and you'll get an email if you're a chapter member proactively. So look for the survey after today, after we log out today. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for all the time, guys. Appreciate you coming. Thanks for having us, Tad.